What's the matter with you? Haven't you ever seen a naked Prime Minister before? This is the BBC Home Service. Here is the news for today, April the 4th, 1955. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth and His Royal Highness Prince Philip were the dinner guests of Sir Winston and Lady Churchill at Number 10 Downing Street this evening. There are strong rumors yet again that Sir Winston, who is in his 81st year, will resign as Prime Minister in the next few days. Sir Anthony Eden, who first became Foreign Secretary 20 years ago, is expected to lead the next cabinet. To go or not to go? That is the question. I must find evidence from my long life to guide me if I should go or stay. I am so tired. But there's no one else can do the job. Anthony Eden, as British Prime Minister, he always wants to be loved. I only want to be right. Eisenhower and Eden against the Russians. I don't fancy those odds. I have made many difficult life and death decisions in my time, defending what I believe in so passionately. Freedom, truth, honor. This is the most difficult decision of all. Oh, they all want me to go, but they could all be wrong. They've all been wrong before. And fashionable people say how wicked Britain was to rule India and Ireland and South Africa. Hospitals and schools are not evil. Ignorance and squalor is evil. I needed the British Empire in order to defeat Hitler. I need what's left now in order to stand up to the Russians. I neither want brandy nor need it, but I should think it pretty hazardous to interfere with the ineradicable habit of a lifetime. You think I'm constantly sozzled? No. A single glass of champagne imparts a feeling of exhilaration. The nerves are braced. The imagination is agreeably stirred. The wits become more nimble. A bottle produces a contrary effect. One may also say unkind things. Bessie Braddock once said to me at a party, Winston, you're drunk. Y yes, Bessie, and you're ugly. But in the morning, I shall be sober. To go or not to go? Where to start looking? Start at the beginning. I was born prematurely. I was in a hurry, as usual. On November the 30th, 1874, my mother was American, Jenny Jerome. She always seemed to me like a fairy princess. I saw little of my mother. She shone for me like the evening star. I loved her dearly, but at a distance. Of my father, I saw less. Lord Randolph Churchill, the finest speaker in the House of Commons. It was my driving ambition to gain his approval. In this, I failed. I disappointed him at school. I was barely 20 when my father died. He was only 44. I assumed I too would die young, so I was always in a hurry. I saw combat on four continents. I was elected as a member of parliament in 1900 and became home secretary in 1910, only a step away from becoming prime minister. It took me another 30 years. I have never been a good party politician. I would rather be right than consistent. I do not say I have always been right. I have often had to eat my own words, and I have found them a wholesome diet. 
I was wrong to support King Edward VIII when it became clear he should abdicate if he wished to marry Mrs. Simpson. I was laughed at as I warned about the rearming menace of Hitler's Germany and Mussolini's Italy. Holiday time, my friends across the Atlantic. It is the summer of 1939. 25 years ago, the German advance guard was hacking its way through the small, weak neighbor countries. Now, this holiday, there is a hush of suspense and in many lands, a hush of fear. One can hear the tramp of armies on maneuvers. Oh yes, always on maneuvers. After all, the German and Italian dictators must train their soldiers. They could scarcely do less in common prudence. When the Danes, the Dutch, the Swiss, the Albanians, and of course, the Jews, may leap out upon them at any moment and rob them of their living space. Then, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain sold the Czechoslovak people into Hitler's slavery at Munich. Peace for our time. It was the tragedy of Britain's leaders that they actually believed in appeasement. An appeaser is one who feeds a crocodile, hoping it will eat him last. Fighting the Germans is unusual for England. Hitler, that haunted, morbid being, who to their eternal shame, the German people in their bewilderment have worshipped as a god. On May the 10th, 1940, the king asked me to be his prime minister. At last! I felt as if I was walking with destiny, and all my past 65 years have been but a preparation for this hour and this trial. The Prime Minister. I say to the House, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears and sweat. You ask what is our policy. I can say it is to wage war against a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark, lamentable catalogue of human crime. You ask what is our aim. I can answer in one word, it is victory. Victory at all costs, victory in spite of all terror. Victory, however long and hard the road may be. For without victory, there is no survival. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Hitler's worst blunder was to attack Russia. He forgot about the winter. There is a winter in Russia, you know. There is snow, there is frost and all that. We all learned about it at school, but he forgot it. I have never made as bad a mistake as that. Stalin began the war very suspicious of me because I had said many hard things about communism and I unsay none of them, especially now. My attitude changed when Hitler invaded Russia. If Hitler had invaded hell I would have at least made a favourable reference to the devil in the House of Commons. Many gullible people have visited Moscow 
you see only what the Russians want you to see. Among the credulous were George Bernard Shaw, the Irish communist vegetarian teetotal playwright, and Lady Nancy Astor MP. Stalin asked her, what of Mr. Churchill? Churchill? He's finished. Not so, Nancy, not then nor yet. She said to me once at dinner, Winston, if I was your wife, I'd poison your soup. Nancy, if you were my wife, I'd drink it. G.B. Shaw sent me two tickets with a note which read, Dear Winston, here are two tickets to the opening night of my new play. Bring a friend, if you have one. Dear Shaw, thank you for your invitation to the first night of your new play, which I must decline as I have a previous engagement. Please send two tickets to the second night, if there is one. At our Yalta meeting, I noticed that President Roosevelt was ailing. His captivating smile had not deserted him, but his face had a transparency, an air of purification. And there was a faraway look in his eyes. When Franklin Roosevelt died, we lost the greatest American friend we have ever known. You can always trust America to do the right thing after they've exhausted all other possibilities. When I was young, I could not imagine life without my father. It was unbearable to watch his swiftly fading shadow, his life cut cruelly short to know I would never hold that dear hand again, never be able to tell him that I loved him, never be able to take my place by his side and take them all on, the two of us together, in the house and on campaign. It was not to be. He died. It is 60 years since I've lost him. What should I do, Father? Are you proud of me now? I want to hear you say, Well done, Winston, I'm proud of all you've done. I love you, I agree with you, I understand. Give that bugger, Anthony Eden, his chance. Anthony, tomorrow I will drive to the palace and resign as Prime Minister. Oh, and Antony, never be separated from the Americans. My life is over, but it is not ended. Never, 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 never give in. Never flinch, never weary, never despair. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. I'm ready to meet my maker, and whether my maker is ready for the great ordeal of meeting me is another matter. We are all worms, but I do believe that I have been a glowworm. <laughs>